you have a, a group of students, for example, first time in a class is an introduction and you're introducing missional church, how do you go about helping them understand and get at what is missional church? Because that's often a question people question kind of people are asking? Uh, most people think they're, th that their church is missional. They think uh, that their church is, by being evangelistic, it's missional. Mm -hmm. They think their mega church is missional. And so I have to sort of uh, facilitate a process for them to discover that maybe that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And so there's a few ways at it. There's, I put missional and attractional sometimes on a, on a spectrum mm -hmm. and talk about attractional has come to us, whereas missional is go and embody, go and dwell. And so uh, we, we talk about that. The emphasis is the energy of the community around the service um, or is the energy of the community out for the community, mm -hmm. the people outside. Uh, and then uh, another way to get at it is the whole Christendom thing, that right. this, there's this Western cultural expectation of going to church and that it is entrenched in people that church is a service at a time in a building. Mm -hmm. And so... That has to, I have to work at ways to dislodge that idea. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so explaining what Constantinianism is, Christendom, uh, looking at the early church, looking at what Jesus thought of the church, uh, these are all ways to sort of um, get at some other ways to think about church. And so, for my class, uh, missional church, right now, church and mission, uh, we're looking at what Jesus thought about the church. Mm -hmm. um, and they start, and then they start making some connections. What would that look like if your church um, worked like Jesus' church? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so start try to get at some of those sorts of things. It's interesting when you talk about, so we're looking at what Jesus thought about the church, because to do that, that really means that you have to live into the scriptures, the texts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll test something with you. In, often in my experience, when you're working with a group of people, when they enter the text, a text, whether it's a parable that Jesus tells or a section of Paul or even the book of Acts, there's just a huge number of assumptions that they bring. Right. And so how do you work with that? Uh, because again, um, for example, uh, I remember working with a group of students around some of Paul's work in Ephesians where he's describing the salvation that God has wrought and all of the students were reading it as a very individualized personal piece right. and was shocked yeah. to discover that that may not have been Paul's primary imagination. How do you work with that? Right, right. I, I, the, what, what the difficulty is there is that um, students don't know the water that they're swimming in. So at that, that point... That means what? That means that uh, they have a particular way of reading the world mm -hmm. through modern lenses. And yeah. so we need to actually go through the Enlightenment the individualism that's happened in the last few hundred years and that how we read scripture and come to scripture. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that they can't get anything out of scripture. Um, it doesn't mean that God can't speak to them through scripture mm -hmm. uh, without understanding the culture that they're in, but uh, it helps to know that uh, what their tendencies might be. Um, it helps them to actually be in reading groups with people from other cultures, two-thirds world cultures, mm -hmm. who will have a more communal uh, yeah. sort of perspective on it. But I think um, I wouldn't want to see any person trained in mission here that did not have an understanding of modernity and what that did to them. Mm -hmm. And so their individualistic reading um, is, is very hard, is a challenge. For example, uh, N.T. Wright's idea that Jesus' repent and believe was actually asking the people to change the way they believed they were to be Israel mm -hmm. and to believe in Jesus' understanding of who Israel is to be. And there was great resistance for the students to take that and remove that from an individualized passage mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. repent and believe mm -hmm. because of all these years of, mm -hmm. and and it's not to say that there's no there's no repentance and believing in an individualistic context that would be beneficial for us with God, but, right? But um, we need to be aware that that is not what Jesus was saying to this particular culture at mm -hmm. that time. So, so there's a sense in which when we ask the question, what is missional church? It's not so much giving them a definition saying, here's three sentences that get it. It's actually inviting them into a world which both questions their world and invites them into a different world. Does, right. does that yeah. make sense in yeah. terms of what's yeah. going on? And the other world has to be the kingdom or the reign of God. And uh -huh. so th that's, 
For me, the, the idea that has to, to leave is this idea of institutional church that, um, that the church is a value and uh, apart from the kingdom at all, that, that the church has identity that we need to build up and make more secure apart from the kingdom. Mm. I think the heretical aspects of church come when the kingdom's forgotten. Mm. And so that the church discovers its true identity and its best identity when it's working within the kingdom and those characteristics that Jesus sort of uh, captured. So it's an alternative world, it's the king, but it, it's the reign of God, it's not any alternative. So there's a sense then, the, the, the question, what is missional church? You're not gonna get that in your first class or your second class. No. Uh, there's a process involved, it takes time. What's your right. experience of that? It is a process. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I think what, what happens is that um, it, is a, it is a huge paradigm shift uh, for people to, to change their views of church. Mm -hmm. um, to be a good Christian has so much to do with institutional Christendom forms of church mm -hmm. that to take that away, that, that being faithful in life is about being at a place and a time every week, mm -hmm. to being a faithful believer. Um, to take that away is very uh, unsettling. Unsettling, yeah. And to replace that towards a kingdom or uh, perspective that that uh, communities form around these kingdom so sorts of ideas and practices is a scary thing. So it is an ongoing process that um, just keeps going. And so mm -hmm. we don't actually get to a very um, completely specific, concrete, once and for all definition of church kingdom. It, it's Good. it's a journey. Mm -hmm. It's a process. A question in that. Um, you, you are a professor of missiology, and so there's a sense in which that's what you teach. You've got all of that. But let me back away from that as, as Ryan Bolger, the human being. How, how did those kinds of shifting imaginations happen for you? Uh, where, did you where did you begin this? Were you, did you, you raised inside this Christendom world? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How did you begin to s look at the water in which you were swimming and say, hmm, maybe I've got a... What was the journey for you? Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, I, um, my wife and, uh, well, let's see. I, I came to faith in through, uh, actually through, uh, or, or grew in the faith through vine the vineyard. And so uh -huh. I had a background with the vineyard. And, uh, and, and so what that meant for us was that uh, I had a faith that really was very experiential. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it made sense in the world. It, it, um, uh, I, I saw, we saw God sort of, my wife and I, we saw God move. We saw, we, we uh, our prayer life was very much something about us and God. Um, we experienced things in worship. That was what captured us and brought us to the vineyard in the first place. Um, the, the, some of the downsides then is our our um, our experience of faith was very spiritualized. Uh, there were certain things that you pray for, certain things that you don't. Mm. Um, and so doing the stuff of Jesus was, which is Wim, Wimber's sort of uh, phrase, was st very spiritualized. Uh, it was um, maybe one small amount of what Jesus was doing, but it wasn't the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. It mm. wasn't the political embodied communal, ethical sort of uh, framework that and you, we And you began sensing that? It only got us so far with, uh, um, you, uh, we, we did a couple church plants with the vineyard and uh, we could address sort of this um, individualized spiritual realm for each person. Right. And when they came to church, they came to have, uh, this is a caricature, but uh, they came to have a you know an individual quiet time at mm -hmm. church with other people singing, and mm -hmm. it was a very ecstatic sort of experience. On the flip side, though, that uh, that didn't always cross over to a transformed practice at work or in the neighborhoods. Um, the whole goal for others to come in was to be able to have that same experience at church, as mm. opposed to seeing the world transformed. Right. Um, I mean, one-off sorts of events would happen where God would speak to the group to care for the poor and that kind of thing. But as far as an overall perspective on uh, transformation, it wouldn't happen. So for me, I, came, I, I was very involved politically in college. I had sort of a social perspective on things. But as I grew in the faith, I learned that um, 
the world wasn't really an object of God's concern. It was mostly my personal soul. Hmm. And so, uh, so I had two different worlds. Right. Actually, it was through some reading and through some influential professors here that these sort of two worlds came back together. So you were a seminary student here at that point? Or? Yeah. Jim McClendon, uh, right. who is a theologian here, um, recommended a book by John Howard Yoder that mm -hmm. appealed to me as a vineyard person because John Wimber taught the Gospels mm -hmm. always over and over and over mm -hmm. again, which was such a different experience from other churches which were completely Pauline. And um, and so I had that history of a Jesus sort of focus. But so then Yoder's Politics of Jesus? Yeah, so yeah. Politics of Jesus, and then uh, which which brought my two worlds together and just, uh, it was almost like a second conversion. Mm. It was really powerful that mm. way. So um, so since then, I've been working out of that um, experience. Wilbert Schenk, who was a professor here, he introduced me to the idea of mission engagement in the West mm -hmm. and that the whole idea of Christendom to, and mission from Christendom to the pagan world and, and how that is really was really always a heresy. Um, sort of opened my eyes to mission and missional engagement. Um, it was something that, that gave explanation for why mission was so difficult for us at the Vineyard and uh, maybe what some of the answers might be. Um, I didn't know what modernity was, and, mm. uh, and so I didn't know the water we were swimming in. Right. So I, I didn't... Um, so this gave some tools and some answers so to what... Seeing, yeah. yeah, what would... Um, the kingdom, you know, the kingdom and this sort of prophetic life is a response to a particular culture and the powers that are in that culture and the dominant sorts of things that go on in that culture. Well, how can we see liberation in those sorts of things if we really don't even know what the culture is? Hmm. And so this good news is a response to something. And so by painting what, what the culture is and really giving a map to the powers, mm -hmm. the Western powers, hmm. then then we can start pondering what a community might look like that's a contrast to that. That's a great image. So yeah, That's really helpful. Um, you yourself are, um, are really familiar, aware, informed, done a lot of research in emergent church. Uh, from your perspective, what is emergent church? Uh, what's happening? Uh, how would you describe it? And what are the connect points? What are the relationships between missional and emergent? That there's a sense today that it's that, that they've been different conversations, but they seem to be coming connected conversations. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you, um, you, uh, you threw out a, uh, a term that I've been fighting against for a long time, but mm -hmm. I'll, um, I'm thinking of actually giving in. I don't know. But I keep saying emerging church, and people keep asking me about emergent church. Uh -huh. And uh, the difference is... is uh, Really, what we were talking about when we said emerging church in the book was That's the this book was you and Eddie wrote uh, the yeah. emerging church. Yeah, we yeah. wrote. Um, we were really uh, in the late '90s. We were looking for something that what would what would it look like for uh, where are there communities that are thinking missionally about the culture mm -hmm. uh, that are looking at it that have understood this sort of po modern and postmodern shift that we've been experiencing since the '60s and. So where are these places? What are they looking like? So we started to do research just on anything that was Gen X, Gen Y, uh, postmodern, baby busters, um, you know, these different sorts of terms that were all being thrown out about. Yeah. Every, you know, in the mid-90s, everyone's wondering what to do about these kids after the boomers and right. everything. And so we were researching everything uh, big churches these all, you know the saturday night service the sunday night service the different sorts of things and um and and so but what we were noticing were these communities were just a shift in style uh we were seeing a little louder music a little raw or preaching maybe some tables maybe some candles maybe some video maybe some artwork maybe some uh, David Letterman, sort of irreverence up there. Um, but still, it was all about the show. 90% mm. of the energy of the community was just all going to that show. So in that sense, it was still very attractional. It was totally, yeah, totally uh -huh. attractional. So it was just a... And, and then we started to see that there was disillusionment with that. Ah. We started to see that there was frustration. And so we were going, well, okay, what does that mean? And we started to see around 2000, 2001, other sorts of communities that were forming... 
that were not um, were the same generation perhaps of people or around that that were starting these communities, but they were very different. Hmm. Sometimes a person was paid, sometimes a person wasn't paid. Uh, the service, the church service was an afterthought. Uh, it was more about a 24-7 community that had a church service. Mm. The secular aspect of their service was that there was more secular items in their spiritual service and more spiritual items in their secular lives than, than what we were seeing in terms of before it was much more fragmented. We were seeing much more uh, story about Jesus, much more about organic community, uh, much flatter sorts of uh, leadership. And so we were starting to see these sorts of just more organic communities pop up. And as a contrast to what we were seeing before, we were grouping them all together. The data just wasn't there. We, there, there wasn't enough commonalities other than uh, maybe a lot of the people who had started these both types were former youth pastors or... Uh, you know, from the suburbs, uh, probably more 30-something than 20-something, had grown disillusioned, you know, but there, um, but the data was so different in terms of the characteristics of those communities. And so one had really challenged the, the sort of the mega churches, uh, young adult service, or these standalone 20-something churches mm-hmm. um, really didn't challenge Christendom. It was still all about attracting people uh, and usually a smaller and smaller segment of people that were raised in Christian homes uh, to the service, uh, whereas these others were not so concerned about church growth. They were not so con- they were more concerned about uh, maybe living in within the culture, something that was more monastic almost, a, a mm. community that was there for each other, twenty or thirty people reading scripture together, eating together a lot, serving the poor however much. And um, and that's sort of how, what, what their goal was. And so now what we started to notice was there was some identification with the term emerging. Mm. Karen Ward used it on a website in 2000. There was some resonance with that. And they were really hearkening to sort of this um, Stephen Johnson's idea of the emergence of ants and, right. you know, those sorts of things of that's bottom book, up. Emergence. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom-up, uh, chaotic sorts of leadership. Yeah. That it's that uh, it's not chaos in the utter, you know, um, completely uh, unpredictable sense, but or maybe unpredictable. But it's 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 not uh, disorganized. It's self-organizing systems that make appropriate sorts of structures as they are needed, as right. opposed to imposed. Right. That's right. So, so there was some resonance with that term. Mm-hmm. So we weren't using emerging church in a prophetic sense. Where some that we're usually where we get critiques is uh, people saying, "Oh, you're saying this is the future of the church." You're describing you, what you're seeing there. Yeah, and so we were using it sociologically. If yeah. they had called themselves the Monkey Church or something, we would have said the the Monkey Church. The Monkey you know? Church. <laughs> so they were saying, emerging. You know, there's some weary, weariness about the term, but actually, we're pretty amazed that that term has stuck around so long because. Uh, a lot of these folks are definitely sort of your contra countercultural sort of people, and for them to allow for a term to describe themselves for mm-hmm. that long mm-hmm. is 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 interesting. But anyway, so emergent is probably the most well known group of these emerging sorts of churches. Mm-hmm. But we there are other movements in the U.S. of more simple churches, organic churches, connections of house churches that wouldn't identify with emergent at all, mm-hmm. but they fit the characteristics of what we saw as emerging church, mm. which was some of the things that I've just described. Mm-hmm. Um, in the UK, they would put themselves into the emerging church, but they it, locally they may be called alternative worship or some other sorts of names, and so they wouldn't be using the term emergent. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so our research mostly was the US, or primarily US and UK, right. so... Um, there may be other movements, obviously, in other parts of the world. But. So talk a little bit about what you see to be the connection between missional church and emerging church. What's interesting is these emerging churches, what, what, like what Todd Hunter was saying, and, and he was a uh, former director of the Association of Vineyard Churches, yeah. uh, and uh, he started a community in 2000 with an and basically, uh, he was trying to work out the missiology, uh, missional church, different sorts of books that he'd read. 
and, uh, and what that would look like. Um, and what I found is that most emerging church leaders have read a lot in missiology, much more than uh, a lot of people that I've, I've met with who are doing church. And so uh, a lot of their resources weren't um, reading church books on better ways to do X, Y, or Z. They, they were critiquing the system itself. And so uh, I think they got it that there was a missional situation. Mm. So... Um, I would say they've they've read uh, very similar sorts of books that, as the missional church movement in the U.S. Um, I think their starting points are different. Say some more about that. You know, the missional church movement is um, is is much more denominationally oriented, mm-hmm. mainline oriented, um, and so I think uh, they're looking to the 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 missional church folks in the U.S. are much more about empowering local church communities with tools to be missional out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say emerging church is not so uh, uh, committed to empowering local church communities to do X, Y, and Z. It's more, probably leans more to a church planting sort of uh, approach where they're looking, what does it look like to be a Jesus community in that culture? Mm. We have 10 or 15 people to do this. What does it look like there? Mm-hmm. Um, not how do we empower uh, churches, often that are 70% nominal or whatever, yep. to, to give them a vision to transform and da-da-da-da-da. Yep. And so, so their, their starting points are different. Also, many of the emerging church folks were probably part of mega churches. Mm-hmm. But they were maybe the youth pastor, that kind of thing. So they're more, uh, probably a little less patient with, sort of long-term traditions right. of, of church. Yeah. And so, I mean, there is a definitely a, a church uh, tradition, the evangelical subculture that they're countering. So their starting point's different. So they're, um, I think what we're seeing with them are, uh, they are closer to um, sort of uh, uh, cultural expression. Their cultural expressions of church are nearer to some of the subcultures in the West than then maybe some of the uh, ways for the mainline church to become more missional. Mm. So the starting point's different. I would say theologically, they have some similar uh, theologies. I would say that um, the emerging church, um, most of their thought life is on, uh, and and their thinking is on those outside the church. Mm. Um, and, And so... I find that uh, when I have conversations with them, even though they're not the missional church, uh, they're thinking like missionaries. Okay. Um, right. w- when I talk to missionaries in the two-thirds world, they love their people. They love that country in Africa, the cultural practices of that. They are talking about that. In my conversations with missional church people, mm. a lot of the conversation is about the church. Right. And so um, those are caricatures. You could have sure. you know, both sides, but yeah. I think sociologically that's how they've changed yeah. there's a sense in which what you're reading sociologically is that the missional church direction has been uh, conversations about the church in which the culture what's happening amongst people and even the gospel are are helpful subsidiary conversations but the conversation is about the church right um, Secondly, uh, you didn't say this, but I want to test this with you. In many ways, it has been a fairly abstract intellectualist conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the same time, there has been emerging um, a whole other kind of piece comprised of sort of younger people and leaders who are asking missionary questions about where they are on the ground amongst the people where they find themselves. Right. Uh, that's a, and again, we are caricaturing, but that, yeah, yeah. that's sort of a, a distinction. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, yeah I would say that. I, I don't d- think it has, I don't, I don't think those divisions actually need to be. Right. Um, there's no automatic enmity between no, them. No, right. Um, they, and like with your book, I mean, yeah. they, there's, there's all sorts of... Um, you know, synthesis and, and, yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, you know, things that, 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 that can be helpful in those conversations back and forth. The, the question here, and this is not about my book, we don't need to go there, but it, it's, um, are there points where you see uh, 
the missional conversation and the emerging conversation starting to come together in some helpful, creative ways. I think those in the emerging church who have been in there for a while, um, and this, ha this is the normal trek that we've seen in a lot of different emerging church communities, is there's a, is there, uh, immediately there's a, a feeling that, when, that somehow this whole ecclesiological system isn't working. And right. so there's a serious disillusionment that happens. Yeah. There's a processing that goes on that from those who overhear it think these people hate the church. Mm -hmm. And so th they're actually just wondering what the point of the whole... Most of the time it's this big suburban system that they're, they're, they're fighting against. Yeah. And so for a while they are deconstructing everything. Yeah. And, uh, and so there's this process and there's, there's continually people coming into it at different places. And so that conversation still uh, continues. But what we found is the people that we interviewed, they may be in that process two to four years, but at the other end of it, um, they're coming up with something creative. Uh, the emerging church leaders that, uh, that I know pretty well are actually fairly helpful and fairly willing to talk and be resources mm -hmm. to missional church people. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, don't, I don't sense this sort of um, hostility that right. way. Um, I think if there were some coordinated efforts to bring things closer to the, together, they probably could yeah. be. I, I think, though, ultimately they're going to want to spend their time on what does it mean to be Jesus in this culture? Right. Um, and I, I think missional church, the closest they've got to cultural analysis, analysis is large pictures of modernity, post-modernity. Mm -hmm. But in terms of on-the-ground subcultures, um, I don't see a lot in that sort yeah. of writing. And, yeah. and so that's where, they're, where the emerging church, I think, is very helpful. They're looking at what it would look like to have an indigenous hip-hop church right. or something like that. Part of what I'm hearing you saying is emerging, the emerging church in its various ways is trying to be, they're trying to be cross-cultural missionaries uh -huh. in their place. How do we live in and understand what's happening, whether it's the club scene or whatever it is, and what, it, what does it look like to be people of God in this kind of environment? Right. And for many of them, it's not even cross-cultural. It's just, how do we uh -huh. make this uh, uh -huh. worship yeah. uh, come from our own culture? Yeah. And so the big thing, the big contribution from the alternative worship movement in England is worship made by ourselves for God, from our culture. From our so culture. That, so that someone outside the culture doesn't have to make a cultural leap to engage in worship with uh -huh. us. It's native to the culture, but it's somehow it's otherly as well because it's worshiping our Creator. So, um, and so it's, it, they're really just trying to actually appropriate the things of our culture in tools that can worship God and that kind mm. of thing. So like in the UK, I mean, um, most people, most people 18 to 35 are in a club scene. Yeah. Uh, it's over 60%, but it, it's not considered um, a place where Christians should stay away from. Everywhere I visited, they go to the club after, after you know, and so, um, and so uh, church planting in the UK is happening somehow in connection with those clubs, whether it's, uh, whether it's through the, I think original stabs were, let's make a church service like a club. Now it's more connecting to the communities and not necessarily feeling like everything we do has to appear like a service. So they may have a church planting group that gets near a club community. They have a few DJs. They are connected relationally to the community and start to see sort of a God movement start. You know, I remember here, you know, professors a, way, a while back saying, how do we connect to these postmoderns? And, and and looking at the class saying, well, they're all postmodern. Um, and so it's an odd conversation for them. So uh -huh. actually it's more, how do we make, how do we make uh, worship and our way of life consistent both with our faith and our culture in ways that um, aren't hostile to, yeah. to that? Mm -hmm.